hierarchy of holiness, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> um, because this is just the tip of the iceberg, really, on God's holiness. Um, so let's just look at the words that are used, make sure it's coming up. Yes, so kadosh is that Hebrew word. I am in Hebrew now, and I haven't actually studied this word a whole lot in terms of in Hebrew, uh, but it's an adjective used 117 times in the, in the Old Testament. In Greek, it's the word hagios. Uh, there's one other weird form of it that's hosios, which is a related word. You know, you're thinking, well, why are you going over Greek right now, Jordan? Uh, just because it does give us insight into the, the meaning of the word and how they were using it. Like it says up there, adjective used 233 times in the Greek. As a verb, it's used 28 times, and as a noun, it's used 10 times. So, do you think the Bible talks a lot about holiness? Yes. Um, for the most part, in the Hebrew, it's normally an attribute of God. So, uh, I don't have a number on this, but of the 117 times, a lot of those are talking directly about God. In the Greek, um, it's actually split, split between God and believer. So anytime you read the word saint or holy ones, obviously, as sometimes it's translated, saint is this word. So believers are holy ones before God. And we'll look a little bit further into why. But let's continue looking at what this holiness is. Mounts, in his dictionaries, describes it. It says, it describes that which is by nature. And here I would actually edit his, um, his definition by saying, in essence. Right? Because nature implies almost a form of creation. But I would say essence. In the essence of God, that which is by essence sacred or that which has been admitted into the sphere of sacred by divine right. It describes, therefore, that which is distinct from the common or profane. So it's either that which is in its essence holy or that which has been made holy. So, and then he goes in to say it's distinct from what's common or profane. MacArthur, in his, and Richard Mayhew, in their biblical doctrine, uh, says God's holiness is 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 his inherent and absolute greatness, in which he is perfectly distinct above everything outside himself and is absolutely morally separate from sin. This definition is centered on the concept of separation, which is signified by the Hebrew and Greek words for holy, kadosh and hosios or hagios. And there are two aspects of God, God's holiness in the evidence found in scripture, majestic holiness and ethical or moral holiness. Those are definitions of holiness. To summarize it, it's God's majesty and his ethical, moral separateness from all that is common or sinful. Are there any questions just on the, those quick definitions? Or anything that you think is missing from these guys' definition? I changed it to essence rather than nature, but that's more of a word choice thing. No questions? OK. And then we'll, we'll jump right into God's incommunicable holiness. So this is, for the most part, an incommunicable attribute. But you'll notice in Mounts' definition, he even says that holiness can apply to that which is brought into the sphere of sacred. So we're going to look at how his holiness is communicated as an incommunicable holiness attribute, perfection. Um, uh, can I get some readers? We're going to do a lot of scripture reading today. Um, for the first one, Habakkuk 1, 12 through 13a. Thank you. And we'll get there in just a minute. And I'll, I'll divvy the rest out as we're talking about them. Yes, so, in amidst Israel's sin, Habakkuk writes that, O Lord my God, my Holy One, we will not die, because he's remembering God's promises to them. And then he, it says this in the beginning of verse 13, your eyes are too pure to approve or to look upon evil. 
and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. That's the moral side of God's holiness. Too pure to look upon sin or evil favorably. And yet he is able to be faithful to his promises and not destroy his people. If I could have somebody read Hosea 11.9. Thank you, Dick. Um, I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the holy one in your midst. And I will not come in wrath. I always imagine him saying it in kind of a whoom kind of a way, but like to say, I am God and not man, right? But what was the last part of that, that verse? Could you read it again, just the last part? I will not come in wrath. I will not come in wrath, right? So he's not pounding his fist on the table and saying, I am God, not man. I am the Holy One of Israel. He's saying it probably with sympathy here, right? With compassion upon his people. So the holiness of God, so far above man. This guy could have somebody read Leviticus 19 too. Yes, thank you. Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Yeah. So we'll look at this one a little bit more later, but it's just a direct declaration. I, the Lord your God, am holy. And with it comes the, the application of be holy because I am holy, right? And we'll talk about that one a little bit more. Just a direct declaration that he is holy. Could I have somebody read Exodus 15, 11? Thank you. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Yeah. So it's a rhetorical question, right? What is the obvious answer to who is like you, O God, majestic in holiness? No one. He alone is majestic in holiness. Uh, two of my favorite passages in Scripture, if I could have us read these kind of back to back. Isaiah 6.3 and Revelation 4.8. Who wants to read Isaiah 6.3? Thank you. And then Revelation 4.8. Thank you. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then Revelation 4.8. And the four living creatures... <coughs> Yeah, <coughs> these creatures are just constantly, never ceasing to proclaim his holiness. Uh, in both Greek and Hebrew, using words multiple times in a row is a way of adding emphasis. And so normally they use it twice to describe something that's emphasized. But this one is three times. Of all the things they could proclaim about him, they're proclaiming his holiness. What a sight to see that would be, wouldn't it, man? Just to see the four living creatures proclaiming his holiness. Gives me goosebumps to think about it. And then to think that eventually we will be proclaiming his holiness in our lives. Completely and perfectly. Now talking about Jesus as the Holy One of God, if we could look to John chapter 6, verses 68 to 69. If I could have somebody read that. Thanks. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Yes, Jesus is proclaimed to be the Holy One of God. If I could have somebody read 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. Thank you. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Yeah. So we have been anointed by the Holy One, by Christ, by God. If I could have somebody read Revelation 3, 7. Sorry. Sorry. The next one. Oh, you've got Psalm 22, <laughs> 1 through 5? All right. I can read Revelation 3, 7 then if... You read it. Sweet. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right? This is what he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. Yeah. He is the holy one and he is in control. He is the holy one of God. Notice there also that holiness is tied to truth and faithfulness there. 
And also notice that this message to Philadelphia is telling them of testing that's going to come upon them. And what does he use to reassure them? His holiness and his truth and his faithfulness. All right, Psalm 22, 1 to 5. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Absolutely. He is holy. And I want you to notice specifically in Psalm 22, 1 to 5, his holiness is not contingent upon our perception of him. So God didn't become holy when the psalmist realized, Lord, you are holy. God was holy even when the psalmist was saying, Lord, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was yet holy then. So, so in this, actually, let's finish Revelation 16. Uh, five, I will read that one. Revelation 16, five. It says, And I, hear, I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judged these things. So in his judgments, he is holy, and he is holy for judging these things. So I want you to note here that we see that the Father is the holy one. We see that in the Old Testament as he is uh, 26 times alone in the book of Isaiah called the Holy One of Israel. Jesus is the Holy One. We have our anointing from the Holy Spirit who is the Holy One. And this is, so don't get me wrong, this is not numerology, I'm not saying that, but I think it's really cool that in Isaiah 6.3 and in Revelation 4.8 they say, Holy, 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 and our God is a triune God. Holy, Holy, Holy. Father is holy, Jesus is holy, Holy Spirit is holy. So that is a very small study of just a couple of verses of God's holiness. Now comes the difficulty of God's holiness with us. We are utterly sinful, right? If I could get a few verses, somebody probably knows Romans 3.23 by heart. Could I have somebody just be put on the spot and... Say Romans 3.23. No? Okay. Can I get somebody to read it? Yes. Yeah. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Notice it doesn't say holy in there, right? But this is the idea of man is utterly sinful. Can I get somebody to read Ephesians 2.1? And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Yeah. I don't tend to look at dead bodies of any kind, right? But when I look at a dead body, I don't go, wow, that is holy. I just, that is worthy of praise or anything like that. Dead. Absolutely incapable of making itself holy. If I could have somebody read Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Yeah. Even from conception, wicked, evil. Jeremiah 17, 9. Anybody? Thank you. The heart is more deceitful than all else, and is desperately Yeah. Our own hearts, desperately wicked. Now, this one was amazing to me. I have never done an in-depth study of Isaiah. Um, but could I have somebody read Isaiah 30, 11? Yeah. Yeah, Isaiah is proclaiming about the Holy One of Israel, and they go, no, stop it, shut up, we don't want to hear this. Wow, right? That was just mind-boggling, the utter sinfulness of man. It was mind-boggling and incredibly convicting, right? Anytime I choose to sin, that's what I'm saying, right? Now, Daniel, and you're probably surprised, like, wow, he's bringing us to Daniel. Daniel is generally known as a holy man, right? But I want you to note how even Daniel, in Daniel chapter 10, verses 8 through 9, is incapable of standing before the glory and majesty of God. Can I have somebody read Daniel 10, 8 to 9 for me? Thank you. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor. 
and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell onto the deep sleep of oh, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Yeah. So he comes into the presence of the Holy One of God, and he falls down like a dead guy. Daniel, who had been fasting and praying for Israel for weeks before that, who had been holy unto God, is still incapable of standing before the Holy One of God. See, we have a problem, right? He does not look upon evil approvingly. And man is naturally that way. So, how do we have holiness then? Mankind's holiness. Again, in that definition, brought into the sphere of that which is sacred by the divine right. If I could have somebody read Exodus 19, 5 through 6. No? Okay, I will read Exodus 19, 5 through 6. It says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So God is proclaiming to them, if you will follow my command, if you will keep my covenant, I will make you a people of my own possession, a holy people. Leviticus 11, 44 to 45. Can anybody read that one? Yeah. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Yeah. Israel is called to a separation from the common crowd, the people around them. In fact, all of Leviticus is going to talk about the need for Israel to separate from the sins of the people around them. Leviticus 20, 23 through 26, I'll read. Moreover, you shall not follow the customs of the nation which I will drive out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I have abhorred them. Hence I have said to you, you are to possess their land, and I myself will give it to you to possess it, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. You are therefore to make a distinction between the clean animal and the unclean, and between the unclean bird and the clean. And you shall not make yourselves detestable by animal or animal or by bird or by anything that creeps on the ground, which I have separated for you as unclean. Thus you are to be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. Notice they have a responsibility, but who is doing the separating still? God. He is the one who's separating his people. And he's saying, I've already put you in separation. All you have to do in Israel is stay separate. Deuteronomy 7, 6. Could I have somebody read that? Okay. Sorry, we've got somebody already. Okay. You can read 14, 2 for me, though. Okay. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured position out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Absolutely. Thank you. And then 14, 2. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And then 26.19 says, And that he will set you high above all nations which he has made for praise, fame, and honor, and you shall be a consecrated people to the Lord your God as he has spoken. Notice in all of these, they are his possession consecrated or made holy to him. So what is it that was going to make Israel holy? God and his possession of them. Can I have somebody read Deuteronomy 14, 21? Either one of you. You shall not eat anything which dies of itself. You may give it to the alien who is in your town so that he may eat it. 
or you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Yeah. So you've got some strange to us rules, right? But why does God give these rules to the people? It's a mark of separation to them, right? This is, this is what they do. This is what you are supposed to do because you are my people. You're not Baals. You're not any of those gods. You are my people. Joshua 24, 18 through 21. Can I have somebody read that? Thank you. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. You will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Yeah, so we have a little bit of a misunderstanding going on there, right? Of, no, we will, we will. Okay, give it 40 years and you'll be back, right? Because they are unable to be holy as he is holy. So is he a, an unfair God who calls people to a holiness they cannot have? No. At least I don't believe so. <laughs> and if you do, we need to talk a little bit more later. But you see, this was for the nation of Israel under a one system, but it was all pointing toward our need to be made holy by him. We are incapable of being holy on our own, and yet he has graciously made a way for us to be holy. Ephesians 1, 4 says this, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. So we've been chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. That way we can fulfill the command of Leviticus 19 too, to be holy as he is holy. Or 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16. Does anybody want to read that one for me? First Peter 1, 14 to 16. Okay, okay thank you. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all of your behavior. Yeah. Uh, 16, sorry. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. All right, so Peter's quoting Leviticus 19, 2. And notice... So the Old Testament law does not apply to us as believers because it's been covered by Christ. But notice that it still has this command in verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your right, in your ignorance, but be holy. Right? So clearly we still need to be separated from the common, the profane, the sinful. And we've been given that ability now as followers of Christ. Matthew 5.48 tells us to be perfect as he is perfect. And then in Hebrews 12.14, this one's hefty. Have somebody read Hebrews 12.14. Yes, the sanctification, that being made holy without which no one will see the Lord. Makes you look at sin a little differently, doesn't it? So, we have an anointing from the Holy One, and we are in the process of being made holy, sanctification. Do we have any questions about what I've talked about? So far. Yeah. Just for my clarification. Mm -hmm. um, in one of the Old Testament scriptures are not to boil the, the goat in its mother's milk. So that was something that pagans probably did. That yeah. Practice, and that's why God was saying, no, 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 don't do that. Yeah. And you'll look in all of Leviticus, and it's just... Some of it's been lost. Like, we have no idea. We're like, why would... <laughs> Why would you boil a goat in its mother's milk? I have no idea. 
right? But clearly it's a way of separating from the people around them. Yeah. And, and even if it wasn't, I've been more and more struck by the fact that there are just some things God told them to do that were strange. Yeah. And they didn't have to have, they didn't have to be a reaction to something else in another culture. Yeah. They were just things, if nothing else, to make the Israelites go, oh, why do we have to do that? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Just do it. Yeah. To drive them toward their need for His holiness. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, now I would like to begin almost a more open discussion time. Okay, so we've talked about holiness. We know that God is so much more holy than we could ever even imagine, right? And that we are utterly sinful in and of ourselves, um, and yet we are called to be holy and we are given His holiness. Um, so what are some things that have been helpful to you in pursuing holiness or things that were hindering you in your holiness that you realized, you know, I need to kick that out. I need to um, obey him. What are some things? Or books, maybe you've read this book right here, The Whole in Our Holiness. It's a pretty good book. So <laughs> that's why I brought it this morning. If you haven't read it, you can check it out. And it's just convicting toward that. Uh, so what are some books that you may have read or some passages that you can think of that you're like, this points me toward being holy or... So take some time to think about that. You don't have to have an answer prepared already. The Pursuit of Holiness. The Pursuit of Holiness, yeah. That's Tozer, right? Or Bridges. Bridges, yeah. Does Tozer have one? Knowledge of the Holy. Knowledge of the Holy, yeah. It's not a book or anything. Just the other day I was listening to, I was sitting in this office and they had Christian music playing. And they had this song that just kept saying over and over, miraculous things happen when the father's in the house and I'm thinking wow what a pathetic view of God yeah you know if, if nothing else as we think about the pathetic mess of our efforts at holiness remembering that that's not true God's always there no matter where you go God is there it's, yeah. he is there you know, yeah wait for him to be in the house yeah he's there everywhere. absolutely Absolutely. And um, something I've been meaning to do more of, but Deuteronomy 6, 4, where it tells us that um, the Lord our God is one. It also tells us to write this on your hand and on your forehead. Keep it as a binding, right? Write it on your doorposts. And I think that's because there's a visual reminder, right? And to just have reminders, hey, God is here and he is one. He's a holy God. You know, just places that I can look and be reminded of that. Not to worship those things, you know, those, I'm not going to put up a cross and a, candles and stuff, and that's where I remember that God is holy, but to be reminded of it. What else is helpful in living out the holiness that we've been called to live out? Um, I was just thinking this morning about somebody that came here years ago, sweet little family, um, Seth Haas did a sermon and I can't remember much of it, but it was in Psalms, and it was about living holy, and um, when things just, you know, flash into your mind, um, what to do with that instantly, and he said, I reject that. <laughs> and I'll bet in his sermon, he said that four or five times and here I am all these years later by the encouragement of one person and one sermon you know that because everybody has them just something you know and there it is and what are you going to do with it yeah be holy yeah I reject that mm -hmm. what does that mean absolutely What other ways? Yeah. Like those the passages in First Peter, kind of close to the Old Testament, but it's, it's not a suggestion for us as a believer; it's a command. Yeah. To be holy, so separate yourself from sin and choose a life of obedience that glorifies God. It's, I mean, it's not easy, but we can't ignore the fact that it's a command. Yeah. It's just a suggestion. Yeah, it's not an option. It's 
the holiness without which no one will see the Father, right? And it's got to be all of your life. You can't be partially holy. You must be holy with a W, holy, right? Holy, holy. What else? What other helpful holiness activities, for lack of a better <laughs> phrase, uh, do we find helpful in just reminding us that it's not just okay for me to sin, that even though I am going to be forgiven, as First John 1, 8, 9, 1 John 1, 9 tells me, doesn't mean I have like a license to sin, right? So how do we, what are some practical ways that we remind ourselves of that? The God we serve is holy. Yeah. Right. Um, so there's, there's in the culture at large. There's very few things that like this is special or this is this is different than our normal mundane things. Yeah. Um, both in culture and in the mainstream church, like a lot of churches don't preach a, a God who is um, holy and and, and uh, supreme and His Majesty and um, His goodness and all these various. Yeah. Perfections that we're setting in this class, and so for me, it's you know just dwelling on the other his, his other excellencies um, helps to, to kind of draw a very stark contrast between him and us. Yeah. Uh, so that like that kind of is is all wrapped up in his holiness. For, you know. Yeah. At least in my reflection and experience. Absolutely. Yeah, and we live in a world where the, the culture is okay with being different as long as it's not holy. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. I think one of the biggest challenges I have is that when you, when you think about God and his holiness and being holy, holy, um, it's, it's the, the bar is so high mm -hmm. that it can be really discouraging just yeah. as you think about it. We're comforted by the fact that through Christ, we will be made that way. We are made that way through Christ. And, and yet we can't take that as an excuse to not just yeah. do everything we can to be as close as we can. Mm -hmm. And especially when we're given an opportunity to make a choice and we have enough time to go, I'm making a choice. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's a moment where you really need to think about what you're doing. Yep. If God's given you that little moment of pause, He's been kind enough to give you that little moment yeah. of pause. He's really focused on making sure you make the right choice. Absolutely. We're not, we're not given the opportunity to, to just rest in what God has done for us. We're commanded to yeah. as much as we can within our imperfection in ourselves. Yeah. And how amazing is then the promise of 1 Corinthians 10, 13 in that, right? I've been given the opportunity to escape or to endure. I don't have to sin. Yeah. Maybe just going off that thought too, that positional holiness, that who we are in Christ, we are holy because of what he's done. So our life in this plane is living out the position of truth. We are made holy, so therefore live it out. Yeah. To best exemplify the holiness that God has. But we, are, we can't make ourselves more holy. Yeah. In Christ, we are complete. We are accepted in the beloved. Live that out yeah. To the world now. Absolutely. I like the passage in Titus 3 where be, because of what God has done through salvation, then, he's, then he tells us in uh, verse 8 that so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent, excellent and profitable for people. And it you know, just be, you know, because of what God has done, He's granted His holiness. Now we're to live it out, walk it out as best we can. Yeah. Yeah, and how great that is, right? That we're not working for holiness; we're working because of holiness. Yeah. And that these it tells us in Ephesians too, that these were established before the beginning of the world for us to do. Like that is amazing. Even 
and that that strikes my pride a lot of the time, right? When I'm like, man, I did a really good job on that lesson, you know? And then I'm like, yeah, but who gave you that before the foundation of the world to do? And yeah, that'll hit you hard, right? When you're feeling pride, and then he says, that's my holiness that you're working, yeah. Which is great, by the way. That's not a complaint against him striking my pride down. Right? What else? What other aspects of holiness? Or maybe even think of this. What ways, because I think it's good for us to reflect, what ways has God helped you be holy as he is holy? Helped you work out, rather, the holiness that you have in him? Um, so just looking through your sanctification process, things that were once a struggle for us may not be now. Or now all of a sudden you don't have that inclination toward that which is sinful or that which is, maybe you don't want to share about it, but, but think through today, even reflect on how God's holiness has positively impacted your life and helped you. Yeah. someone into your life to, I don't know, for me, I just, I think about in my past and uh, when I was going through that time of making a decision to follow Christ, the things that I was involved in, you know, at first, we're like, gosh, you know, I'm not doing this, and, and, and so you've got the people who, who you used to hang out with, they're like, you know, you come with us, and no, I'm mm -hmm. not, but then, you know, you meet somebody, you know, God put a friend in my, in my life that, I don't know, just, he made it, he made it a way. He made yeah. It and eventually, uh, that person eventually became a wife. And, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. But, uh, yeah. You know, God's there for us. Yeah. So, to grow us. Absolutely. One of my favorite verses is Philippians 1.6, uh, where Paul is reminding the believers, he says, I'm confident of this very thing that he who began the good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Uh, it's one of my favorites because I was saved at four <laughs> and then from like seventh grade up to my senior year of high school, I was not living for him, right? But who was faithful in that time to draw me back to himself? Him, to show me the holiness that he had given me. What else? Maybe other ways God's holiness has been shown in your life or in the life of those around you. And when I say that, the life of those around you, I don't mean <laughs> point out in a way that somebody around you needs to grow in holiness, right? <laughs> since I was five, you know, mm -hmm. and again, when I was 13, I was like, oh, Lord, if I'm not saved, let me be now, and, um, you know, so I did have an understanding, but um, I realized I had everything from God on a silver platter and had no appreciation for it to the point to where, um, I would return like a pig to his vomit. Mm -hmm. Boy, is that, you know, graphic. And he is no pig. Yeah. You know? Yep. And he takes us back, right? Yes. That brings me to the, uh, uh, the verses that I want to close us out with this morning, probably just a couple minutes early. But what is the appropriate response then to the holiness of God? And, and I think we find that in... Well, I know we find that in Revelation chapter 4, uh, verses 8 through uh, 11. I'm going to read those, and if you want to turn there, that would be great. 
Revelation 4, 8 through 11, because you might be an auditory learner, but it's good to also see the words. Revelation 4, 8 through 11. It says this, And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings and full of eyes around and within, and day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. That's the appropriate response to God's holiness. Worship and adoration to him. Living in a way that is prostrate before him. Let me pray and close this out and then we can go eat. Father, thank you for your holiness, Lord, for your righteous judgments and for your perfection, Lord, that somehow you have granted to us your holiness, Lord. Lord, and it baffles our understanding. Uh, and we so often fail to live according to holiness, Lord. But help us in our walk to, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we have been called. So I pray that we would do this today and tomorrow and all this week and, and with it geared toward you. So it's in your name I pray. Amen.